In this session, we will be looking at the uh, rise of Catholicism in the 19th century. When we were looking at uh, Catholicism in the end of the 18th century, uh, we saw a church beginning to become a part of American culture, finding the freedoms uh, that others had in the Reformation, excuse me, in the Revolution, as they variously attempted to uh, become a part of American culture in ways that they had been prohibited before, serving in public office, um, prohibited from worshiping publicly, etc. But it was also a church trying to find its way in America uh, as an American church versus a European or Roman uh, Catholic church. Largely, a lot of that uh, fell apart uh, towards the beginning of the 19th century as uh, various facets uh, developed uh, and Rome began to pay attention to what was going on. And so uh, that left uh, the church in somewhat of disarray and uncertainty as, it, uh, as American history moved on. The story of the 19th century, however, is the story of an explosion of Catholics, a um, majority of them coming from immigration. Uh, that there is a massive wave of immigration that takes place from the early decades of the uh, 19th century to the very early decades of the 20th century. And so over the course of this session, we'll be looking at some of the major groups uh, that immigrated. Um, excellent work that's been done by a variety of Catholic historians uh, that I'm drawing from here, uh, you know, kind of pulling uh, all of this uh, together. And certainly if you are interested in more of this information, I'd be glad to uh, share uh, some of those sources and, and who else uh, to be uh, looking at. Um, but, uh, you know, historians have pointed to six major ethnic groups that came to the United States in the 19th century that radically transformed uh, American culture, American Christianity, uh, and Catholicism especially. In 1815, uh, why 1815? 1815 was the death of John Carroll, uh, who we focused on in the previous session about Catholicism. And so when he died, there were 80 Catholic churches in the United States, 70 priests, and we talked about some of the challenges that priests faced uh, in the colonial period, and there were about 70,000 Catholics. A rather small number, um, but radically different within a very short amount of time. Uh, by 1865, by the end of the Civil War, there were 3.5 million Catholics in the United States, which made it the largest denomination. Now, certainly, if you, um, <coughs> excuse me, if you put all of the Protestants together, if you counted all of the Protestant groups together, there are more Protestants in the United States than there are Catholics. But as far as any one specific group, Catholicism has been the largest religious group since uh, 1865. Those numbers will continue to grow uh, throughout the, the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century as well. As I mentioned, there were six major ethnic groups that immigrated um, that really kind of shaped this sizable change. In what follows, we'll, we'll survey each of those uh, developments, uh, but what I'm wanting you to focus on for the class is some of the, the basics. Who these groups were, why they came, and what their relationship was to the larger church. That's the, the general um, overview of what I'm looking for you to, to know from this information. We'll take them 
roughly in chronological order, though certainly we could make some adjustments, but we'll, we'll take them roughly in chronological order from their arrival. The first major group uh, to pay attention to uh, is the Irish. Irish immigration um, started around 1800. Beginning in the 1830s and 1840s, it rapidly accelerated. Between 1840 and 1860, 2.5 million people, Irish people, came to the United States. Um, after about 1860, it begins to trail off. There are about another million that come uh, to the United States after that time. This, these are low estimates. And the reason is it was often cheaper to go to Canada and enter through Canada and then come to the United States than to come directly to the United States. And so uh, these are predominantly statistics for those that came directly to the United States. So we, you know, we, we know that these are low. The reason that a majority of people are coming uh, that are Irish, uh, and a majority of them being Catholic, um, is the potato famine. The, the potato crop uh, had a substantial decline uh, in the uh, 1840s uh, that really caused a lot of problems. There were, there were 20 famines, 20 potato famines, between 1700 and 1900. Uh, and the potato was a significant staple of the Irish diet, diet uh, and so that had a uh, really big impact on, on their lifestyle. Um, by 1840, uh, Ireland has a higher population. They are more dependent upon the potato, and the blight, the potato blight, was much worse than it had been before, um, with sometimes uh, entire crops uh, being destroyed, um, which led to um, a lot of death, um, and out of that death disease and it's estimated that um, between 1845 and 1848 uh, between a third to a half of the Irish people died about 25 percent though of, of Irish left and so one in four which the travel over here wasn't that much better in some respects. Uh, the ships that they left on and, and came to the United States on were often referred to as coffin ships because they were not seaworthy, uh, they weren't very sanitary, uh, they were overcrowded, and disease was rampant. Uh, for example, in 1847, on one boat, uh, 440 people left Ireland on this one boat 108 died at sea. When they arrived, 150 had some a fever, and most of those died soon after. So a sizable portion of the, just that one boat uh, died. The average life expectancy uh, for um, Irish that came in those, those uh, early years was about six years. Um, many of them ended up sick. Those that were... In better health, were forced into rough labor, um, and and often worked to death. A lot of the people that came uh, were single people and families, all of them poor. Unlike some other groups that we'll see, all of them came intending to stay. There was not a desire to come, earn your wealth, go back to Ireland. And it's not that they hated their country, it's just that they considered there to be nothing left for them back there. And so the goal was to uh, stay in the United States, most of them ending up in cities like Boston and Philadelphia and New York. Um, there were some that moved to uh, rural areas uh, and were involved in uh, various things uh, through there. Largely, we can stereotypically say... Um, that the Irish were rather obedient to the clergy of the church. They were, they were very obedient to the church. Now, 
that's probably to some extent an over oversimplification. Uh, so we have to be careful how uh, far we want to push that. There were certainly Irish that had problems with the hierarchy of the church. But in general, most Irish people followed the leadership of the church. That if what the priest said, if the priest said it, it was true. And a lot of people didn't question the authority. Um, which led to a lot of the bishops and priests who developed over the next century um, tended to be Irish. And they dominated the priesthood in the United States well into the 20th century. Which led to some challenges as the Irish interacted with uh, some of these other ethnic groups um, because uh, they uh, they didn't often see eye to eye about what the appropriate response would be. We'll, we'll see some of these other groups aren't as obedient to the clergy, aren't as connected to the institutional church. And so that uh, caused some conflict with the uh, the Irish priests and bishops who believed, you know, that the, the common person should be, um, you know, obedient to the clergy. The second group that arrived uh, was the Germans. Now, not all of the Germans that are coming to the United States um, are... Uh, Catholic, but there was a sizable number of Germans coming, um, and and Germany in in this time period is is in some disarray. Um, you know, tr um, Germany comes out of the breakdown of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, and so there's some uh, you know things taking place here over the 19th century of of Germany kind of being organized into a distinct country. Between 1820 and 1920, there were about 5.5 million uh, Germans that arrived. Again, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's a large number, not all of them Catholic. Um, and really, the, the high points are between the end of the Civil War and 1900. That's when most of these Germans come, with kind of the 1880s uh, being the high point, between 1880 and 1890. Uh, 1.8 million Germans arrived. Now, Catholics come in greater number because of the um, rule of Otto von Bismarck, uh, who is uh, leading Germany at the time. And uh, he is very anti-Catholic, has a variety of anti-Catholic policies. And so uh, these families are fleeing persecution uh, including a lot of uh, nuns and priests uh, who are coming as well. Uh, some of it also is for um, economic reasons, uh, but a lot of it is, um, you know, these kind of uh, persecution reasons. And because of the persecution that they have been experiencing, a lot of the Germans tended to um, group together in various places. And so you'll find... German towns or Germantown uh, in a variety of suburbs of cities like uh, Philadelphia, for example, uh, where Germans tended to group together. A lot of them are wary of Protestants, but they're also interested in blending in with American culture, which is not as hostile to them as German culture was. But there is still a desire with a lot of them to maintain some the German language, German traditions um, to some extent. Now, especially as World War I hits, uh, there is an extra effort by Germans uh, to try and blend in because of um, the suspicion and sometimes even persecution that they faced uh, because of being German. And Germany, of course, is the, uh, the major... Uh, enemy in World War One. 
The third group to arrive uh, are the Italians. Now, at this time, um, Italy is also kind of being reorganized. And so in the middle of the 19th century, uh, Italy is undergoing uh, what's known as the Rigiorimento, uh, which is kind of a consolidation of Rome, or excuse me, of, of Italy, which leads to the loss of the Papal States. And you can see on this map, the Papal States were, was kind of this region in the center of uh, what became Italy. And so as it is reorganized, um, the, the Pope essentially kind of becomes trapped, so to speak, uh, in Rome, in the Vatican, uh, until 1929, when there are some uh, arrangements made between the Vatican and the Italian government. So that kind of, uh, I think, is important to uh, set the stage here for where the Italians uh, are about this. Uh, between 1890 and uh, 1920, uh, 4 million Italians come. Almost all of them are Catholic. Uh, really peaks, majority of them arrive between 1900 and 1920, uh, when it's about 3 million of them. A majority of them come for economic reasons. Italy had seen a steep rise in population, uh, which led to a competition for land, and there was little decent farmland in Italy. And so a lot of the people that come, a lot of them rural, uh, mostly from southern Italy, um, you know, try to come to the United States. Um, it's generally men, it's about three to one men to women, come to the United States hoping to earn money to send back or to save and go back and buy land. And so most didn't um, anticipate staying. They left their families behind. Because of this, they had very little interest in assimilating. They learned enough English to get by. Um, and most of them stayed in kind of these Italian communities. Which led to, and, and uh, about half of the single men eventually go home. So, for example, between 1899 and 1924, 3.8 million came, uh, 2.1 million returned. If these men, the men that decided to stay, often uh, had to wait long times, three to four years before they were reunited with their families. Uh, lots of uncertainty. In many respects, the Italians were often uh, exactly opposite of the Irish. Uh, the Irish were deferential to the priests, obedient. The, uh, the Italians, though, on the other hand, were anti-clerical, wanted little to do with them. Again, by this time, a lot of the priests are Irish, uh, and so that causes some problems. Um a lot of the focus of the Italians was on devotions in the home, um, devotions related to what, what's called the Holy Family, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And that would include these uh, street parades of carrying images of Mary, for example, uh, through these Italian parts of various cities. But, uh, you know, they're not as interested in kind of assimilating to the institutional church. Uh, in the United States, especially as, as led by these uh, Irish bishops and priests. The fourth group to arrive were the Polish. Now, they're coming from three different regions controlled by other countries. Essentially, some controlled by Russia, some controlled by Germany, and some controlled by Austria. So there is no Poland at this time. Um, now there had been, but uh, you know it's it's broken down, and uh, that's a very important uh, development for how uh, Polish Catholics uh, will see themselves. Between 1870 and 1920, about two million Polish Catholics came. 
they came for many reasons. For those uh, Polish who were in regions controlled by Germany, uh, a lot of them led, uh, fled excuse me, uh, persecution. So they came to the United States fleeing persecution. Um, other uh, Polish who were peasants uh, came looking for land. About a third of them were these individual single men, uh, single workers looking to come um, and make some wealth. Many of them intending to go back, but once 1914 and the outbreak of World War I took place, they found that they couldn't go back. And so a lot of those people that had intended to go back are kind of stuck. In many respects, their identity as being Polish is tied up with their ideas about being Catholic. And so there isn't much of a distinction between being Polish and being Catholic. They're one identity. And largely, historians will argue that this was due to, um, you know, their country is partitioned with these three other countries t taking control of it. And so their c Catholic identity is so embedded in their Polish identity because the church has essentially become a surrogate for their national identity. Because of the importance of their ethnic identity, a lot of Polish Catholics held on to their language and their culture and weren't interested in assimilating to the United States and weren't interested in assimilating with other Catholics. Uh, they did not feel uh, a lot in common with other ethnic Catholics. And so they developed kind of their own Polish Catholic churches rather than kind of integrating into other Catholic churches that were already established. A lot of their attention was on the suffering Christ. I mean, there's, there's a couple of different ideologies of Christ, of course, that we can think about. Um, and a lot of Catholics meditated on images and ideas of Christ's suffering, but the Polish especially um, were more focused on the suffering Christ and less on kind of a transcendent, peaceful Mary that other Catholics would have been uh, tied to. The fifth ethnic group of Catholics were the French Canadians. Um, their immigration was short but intense. About a million people come between 1880 and 1900. Almost all of those are Catholic. Majority of them came looking for work, and so two-thirds settled in uh, to milling and textile places in New England. There were some that moved to Louisiana uh, and kind of established the Cajun culture there, um, but most of them are in New England. Um, there were there was uh, efforts by New England uh, manufacturers to go to Canada and bring uh, some of those Canadians uh, to New England to work in their um, their uh, their mills. Uh, they tended uh, to be very fluid with their relationships across the border, and so they kind of go back and forth, visit family, etc. And so they don't really integrate too much into American culture in these early periods and tended to keep their French culture, uh, French language, little desire uh, to assimilate. The last group to discuss is... Um, the uh, Mexicans. Now, in some sense, it's it's not really appropriate to talk about Mexican immigration at this time. So, for example, at the end of the war with Mexico in 1848, um, essentially a large portion of what was northern Mexico was annexed by the United States. So they about 80,000 Mexican Catholics suddenly became part of the United States. They had not made a decision 
to move. Another 500,000 will come voluntarily later. And of course, since that time, there have been a variety of uh, immigrations. And the border, of course, has been arbitrary. Um, you know, and, and like, I'm, like I mentioned here, you know, a lot of this transition took place uh, because of, you know, some redrawing of, of borders. Certainly, there has been immigration of Mexican Catholics since that time, uh, although we're starting to see more and more um, Catholics in Central and South America convert to Protestantism, particularly Pentecostalism, uh, and we will uh, probably touch on that in a later session. One of the challenges that uh, the Mexicans faced was a pressure from Irish clergy to conform to Irish worship patterns, um, to speak English, to become American citizens, and there was not an interest from the Irish to learn Spanish, and so instead they kind of um, pushed learning English, but the Mexicans as well come with their ideas of Catholicism that are shaped by the spirituality of the missions, as we talked about, the symbols, the processions, the syncretism uh, we had seen. And of course, for Irish uh, clergy, you know, that doesn't look like Catholicism. And so there was a struggle between the hierarchy and the common Mexican Catholic because of some of these differences in what they thought uh, Catholicism should be about. Uh, by 1916, uh, there were 15.7 million Catholics in the United States, and 75% of them were first-generation immigrants. So those are the four major groups that immigrated. Let's talk a little bit about how they approached um, thinking about uh, what, how they should relate to American culture. We've touched on this uh, a little bit as we were going through. But in general, uh, when it came to assimilating to the United States, there were a couple of different approaches that uh, Catholics took. One, were, one approach was what we might call assimilating groups. These would have been groups that basically didn't have any language changes and had a relatively easy blending approach. Predominantly, the only group that really fits in here is the Irish. Now, there were some stigmas attached to racial or ethnic notions. Um, and so there was a lot of ethnic uh, opposition to Irish, a, a lot of um, stigmas attached to being Irish. But it was a lot easier for the Irish to assimilate to American culture uh, especially with the numbers of people that were coming to the United States. There were what we might call assimilating groups, or excuse me, so semi-assimilating groups. These would have been groups that uh, wanted to retain their language. Um, they had links uh, to their ethnic identities, but these were not as pronounced or not considered as um, essential maybe as uh, they would have been for some other groups. Uh, the Germans, for example, would have been a group that would have fit into uh, this model. There were the Catholic nationalists. The Polish would have been uh, the primary uh, example of this. Uh, people that attain, uh, kind of retained uh, their ethnic identification, people that were very connected to their country of origin, and uh, you know, that kind of marked them as distinct from uh, others in the United States. And then there were uh, Im immigrant groups that would have been considered missionary groups, groups that the church hierarchy thought needed to be essentially evangelized, um, that there was a need to make them better Catholics, so to speak. Um, they also tended to be uh, anti-clerical, resistant uh, to the church uh, attendance. Uh, the Italians would have been an example of this. Now, I think in many respects, we, we kind of 
need to see here that these immigrants are facing a variety of pressures that pull them in a variety of different directions. Um, you know, desires to remain tied to their homeland while being pressured to assimilate. Um, there's desire to hold on to your ethnicity, to, you know, have your family life be like family life was in Europe, uh, you know, follow the same food, devotional styles, language. There's economic pressures. Um, a lot of them were exploited laborers, but they wanted to send money home uh, to maybe bring home, bring their families over. Uh, they're expected to contribute to the church. There's a pressure not to stick out too much in uh, the country. Uh, so they face a lot of pressures and uncertainty um, in, in trying to, to fit in or not, or uh, you know, try to uh, make their way. Uh, in the United States. And as the uh, different groups immigrated, that put some pressure on the church as well. One of the things they were concerned about is degeneration. Right? You know, there's, there's this concern of here come these large ethnic groups they're kind of on their own. We need to get, get them connected with the church or they'll fall away. Now, certainly, the church is growing sizably. Um, they, you know, millions of people uh, are coming, which does make the church strong numerically. But, you know, there's this concern of people falling away, people uh, maybe being converted to Protestantism. There are the language problems that they have in, uh, you know, trying to um, relate to these new immigrants, along with devotional styles as well. Uh, different people having uh, different ideas about, you know, how do you approach God? How do you approach the saints? What's the proper way to be Catholic? And so the church is facing, the institutional faith, church, the, uh, the hierarchical church is facing a lot of challenges to try and address the, the issues that are arising with this sudden influx of ethnic immigrant Catholics um, that they are trying to address. And as they did so, there are a couple of approaches that they are taking, and one of those has to do with the, the parish. The parish was the local church, the region uh, that was related to um, the local church. And traditionally, Catholicism in Europe, and then as it starts in the United States, um, in the colonies and then the United States, had largely been operated under a territorial model where the parish was a geographic boundary. If you were, if you lived in this particular region, this particular area, then you went to this specific church and there is you know, one church per parish. Well, that caused some, some difficulties because here you have this influx of immigration sometimes of multiple ethnicities coming in and you have more people than one church can handle. You have a variety of languages. You have disagreements with the priests with these various ethnicities. And so the territorial model in the United States did not work like it did in the uh, old country, right, in Europe, in, in places where basically you had one ethnicity, people shared the same language, shared a lot of other aspects, they didn't have the same uh, problems. And so what the church started to do in various places was to adapt into an ethnic or national model, where you would group around an ethnicity 
rather than a specific territory. And so the geography wasn't as important because the commonality was more in the country of origin. There was also an attempt to try and uh, bring priests to these ethnic parishes who were from uh, the home country, right? And so Italian priests or uh, Polish priests. Now, a lot of the actual worship services, the liturgy for mass, would have been performed in Latin, which was common across the globe. Right? The liturgy was performed in Latin, except for a few places, but a majority of it was in Latin. And so that was the same across these ethnic parishes. But other practices like confession, uh, any sort of devotions that were done, uh, would have been performed in the specific ethnic language. And a lot of the symbols, um, statues of Mary, would have been more ethnically created to look more like people from uh, a specific area. And eventually you have in some places, some of these major cities, there's these overlapping of parishes where there's kind of the region of a particular parish overlaps with another parish uh, because you have these, these ethnic, uh, these ethnic groups. Um, now in some cases uh, where the where the territorial parish was maintained, you often had immigrants gathering to create these uh, separate devotional groups. So even though you might be in a territorial parish with other ethnicities, you might have associated with um, those from your same culture, right? The Germans uh, or uh, the, you know the Mexicans or whatever gathering to form uh, devotional groups. Uh, you know they wanted to meet at other times with people. Um, many of those then, uh, you know, did kind of buy buildings, form their own churches, um, which was, was a challenge for the Irish priests because they considered the territorial parish normal and, uh, you know, they wanted to see things like this. Plus the ethnic priests didn't have the close connection with the Irish bishops like the Irish priests did. And that's so, uh, so there were still territorial uh, parishes, which had gotten a lot of the, the funding, etc. For the Polish, especially, as we mentioned, um, you have this um, surrogate for the national identity in the parish in the Catholic Church. And so the Polish, especially, uh, turned to these ethnic parishes, um, you know, for, for that connection with Poland. The, the system worked. Um, it kept Catholics connected to the, uh, the church. Um, it, it somewhat connect, uh, had control over the ethnic priests, ethnic Catholic, Catholics, um, compared to the Irish, um, but it was not a perfect system. Uh, it, it, there were a lot of struggles that, and tensions uh, that, that still um, maintained themselves uh, among Catholics uh, at the time. Not only did Catholics face tensions within the Catholic Church, but there were also challenges that Catholics faced from the Protestant groups outside of them. And this anti-Catholicism was something that did bind Catholics together. Now, what I mean by anti-Catholicism is any sort of thinking or saying or writing against Catholics. Um, some of that was uh, theologically driven, uh, kind of like the Reformation, a rejection of uh, the hierarchical model, the papacy, etc., things like that. Others of it would have been more culturally driven and politically driven, and so we'll talk uh, some uh, about that. But essentially, uh, for a lot of Protestants in the United States, Catholicism was a dark alien world that they did not understand. Um, for a lot of modern Protestants, it, this was a, a holdover from the rational past. Um, and so, you know, they were very suspicious of it, uh, weren't entirely sure what to do with it. 
But on one hand, it was very compelling. They were very interested in Catholicism um, and what Catholics were doing, not in the sense of wanting to become Catholic, but in the sense of you know, being drawn to hear about how dark and alien it was. Right? So a lot of Protestants were very interested in talking about it being alien and how uh, weird and strange it was. But the, the weirdness and the strangest that they believed was also uh, very repulsive. It's like, it's horrible what they do. Uh, so they're very interested, but it's, you know, very terrible. And it's like, oh, that's horrible, but tell me more, right? And so that's kind of the mentality that a lot of people, uh, a lot of Pro Protestants had towards Catholicism. Essentially, uh, we're going to be talking about two types of uh, Catholicism, um, cultural anti-Catholicism and political anti-Catholicism. Uh, we won't spend uh, too much time talking about um, theological anti-Catholicism, although a very important one uh, as well, but sometimes wrapped up with some of these other um, ideas. Cultural anti-Catholicism refers to the ways in which Protestants approached and approach Catholicism as being different from Protestantism. Uh, you know, it, paying attention to the differences that existed between Protestants, Catholics, uh, when it came to the structure of the church, right, the hierarchy, uh, to the rituals that were different between Catholics and Protestants, to the differences uh, between uh, aesthetic views, you know, what, what's what's beauty, what's beautiful in a religious sense, uh, the devotional styles, you know, paying attention to um, some of the ways that Catholics worshipped. And so in many respects, we can say that cultural anti-Catholicism tended to focus on practices, uh, devotion to Mary, uh, saying of the rosary, engaging of, in pilgrimages. All of these were um, ways in which uh cultural anti-Catholicism was expressed. When it came to practices, there were a couple of things that uh, Protestants tended to uh, argue about Catholic practices, Catholic rituals. Um, looking at something like the way that Catholics were devoted to Mary or to the saints, and the way they would pray to Mary or to the saints, they would argue, a lot of Protestants would argue, that what's going on here is idolatry, uh, that they have created graven images, or that they're worshiping somebody other than God or Jesus. Um, you know, and not really understanding what Catholic devotionalism is about. Um, you know, there, there was this sense for Protestants that this was idol worship. This was not true Christianity because uh, Catholics had turned to worshiping false gods. Additionally, uh, they felt that a lot of the practices that were being performed by Catholics, especially men, kind of made them less masculine, um, particularly devotion to Mary, uh, that there was such an attention to Mary uh, that, uh, you know, that this, this made them less than men or made them less manly, uh, that they were becoming sissified, so to speak, uh, was, was the way that a lot of Protestants looked at it. And they looked at a lot of the practices as, as being kind of childlike, uh, that they were, uh, you know, especially connected with Mary, uh, you know, they, these are children approaching mommy so to speak. And so there was a lot of um, anti-Catholicism uh, focused on, on practices. When we talk about political anti-Catholicism, uh, we're, we're talking about ways in which anti-Catholics contrasted the political outlook of the United States with Catholicism, basically arguing that Catholicism was anti-democratic. The reason they argued this was by paying attention to or, or focusing on the bureaucratic structure of the church. Uh, that 
what was present in Catholicism is one person at the top of the church and a lot of hierarchy and the, co the common people didn't have, um, you know, the, they didn't have uh, much say. Now, in some cases, there's some anti-democratic leanings in Protestant groups as well. Um, but the argument was being made that essentially Catholics were opposed to democracy. And we can even see this into as late as the 1960s when John Kennedy was running for president of the United States. A lot of Protestants were fearful or at least claimed that if Kennedy was elected, that he would be beholden to the Pope and the Pope would subvert uh, democracy. Um, and so, you know, this is a large part of what... Uh, what Protestants were uh, saying about Catholics at the time. Catholics were accused of being secretive, that they are um, separate uh, from uh, the, the country, they're not um, very involved. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, of accusations here about conspiracies, a lot of fears uh, that uh, people were... Um, you know, that the Catholics were out to uh, rule the world. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they attended to think that there was a great Catholic conspiracy that was going to overthrow the United States. So the, the separateness of Catholicism was looked at uh, very, uh, you know, they were, they were, um, mistrusted, uh, they were looked at, uh, Catholics as being deceitful, etc. But as I mentioned, there's this kind of love-hate relationship with Catholicism. Um, it's devious yet compelling, um, but people have just been drawn to it. And so a variety of stereotypes were developed about uh, Catholicism. Uh, that were promoted uh, in wide ways, in writings, in, um, in sermons, uh, in all sorts of different ways. And the, the two types of anti-Catholicism, political anti-Catholicism, cultural anti-Catholicism, the two kind of reinforced each other. And so, you know, Catholic, uh, excuse me, Protestants uh, claimed that Catholics were be believed in magical thinking, uh, you know, things like uh, the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of uh, Christ, right? And so a lot of this magical types of thinking, uh, they argued that um, the celibacy of priests and nuns was not really celibacy, uh, but was uh, encouraging them to engage in um, illicit types of sexuality. Uh, we, we sometimes refer to it as being kinky. Um, you know, that, that there were all sorts of actually horrible sexual activity uh, that was going on between priests and nuns. That uh, Catholicism was undemocratic and dangerous, and that they were obsessed with, de with death, blood, and flesh. And so, you know, these were... Uh, very important ways in which Protestants looked at Catholics and they became so entrenched in um, the, uh, the Protestant mind that it led to a lot of uh, conflicts. And we'll talk more about that uh, here in a minute. And so there's this, uh, there's this repulsion that happened. Uh, you know, that there's this, uh, there's this stereotypical view of uh, Catholics that's reinforced and reinforces the, the hatred that Protestants had for them. Um, though there's those lingering concerns about Catholic power that we see from the earliest times of Protestantism in England. And so these just kind of continue to be reinforced in the Protestant mind. And so, you know, their 
they're very much developing an identity as Protestant in opposition to Catholicism. Okay? That, that who we are is that we are not Catholics. And often the way this was presented was in a variety of, of contrasts. Catholics were one thing and Protestants were something else. So in one respect, Catholics were considered to be lustful. Right? A lot of sexual uh, deviancy uh, trapped up in Catholicism. On the other hand, though, Protestants were self-controlled. They were pure. Catholics were superstitious. Right? Believed in a lot of superstitions. Protestants, on the other hand, were very rational. Now, again, there's certainly a lot of Protestantism in 19th century America that we can point to that is very superstitious, and there were a lot of Protestants who were not self-controlled and pure. But this is the way Protestants are kind of creating their own identity, uh, and they're creating their own enemy, so to speak. They're crafting the image of the enemy. Um, Catholics were considered to be servile. Look at the way they follow after the priest. Um, look at the way they, um, you know, are servile towards the bishops and the pope. Cat uh, Protestants, on the other hand, are autonomous. Uh, they are free. Uh, you know, that we uh, we Protestants uh, are our own interpreters of Scripture. We make our decisions on our on our own. We don't have to uh, serve the pope. Catholics were viewed as emotional, but the Protestants were intellectual. Now, again, there is a lot of Protestantism that was emotional. We just need to go back to uh, the section on the Great Awakening and the section on the Great uh, Second Great Awakening to see right, a lot of Protestant uh, experience was wrapped up in emotionality. But Protestants, especially Protestant leaders, tried to present themselves uh, as intellectuals versus the emotional Catholics. Um, Catholics were wrapped up in the material with their statues and their rosaries and all sorts of other physical objects, but Protestants, on the other hand, were, uh, liber uh, were, were literary. Right? We, the Protestant was connected with the Word of God and preaching. Uh, sola Scriptura, a high le higher level of uh, religiosity. And so on the one hand, you have this kind of repulsion. You know, this oh, this is terrible. But there is also that attraction, that, that fascination with uh, understanding the, the horror of Catholicism. And, uh, you know, so this becomes a very uh, attractive, uh, that it's it's about repression and the things that are forbidden and scandalous. Uh, and so people are very, very interested in hearing more about it, even though they know, right, well, we shouldn't talk about it. It's terrible to hear with them, but, but I'm very, very interested in it. And uh, this is kind of connected with a rise in literature uh, in this later romantic period known as Gothicism. Um, you know, kind of a, a outgrowth of romanticism where there's this focus on uh, terror and horror, imprisonment, uh, virgins in distress, demons in disguise. Uh, and so there's a lot of this type of fiction that kind of replicates some of this attraction to uh, the terrible um, and the repressed and the forbidden. And one example of that is this anti-Catholic convent literature that develops in the early decades of the 19th century, uh, where various people write these uh, books about, and, and most of them from women, uh, writing about this idea of they have escaped from these convents and let me tell you what was going on in them. One popular uh, book at the time by a woman named Rebecca Reed uh, was called Six Months in a Convent. Uh, that's the short title. The full title is Six Months in a Convent or the Narrative of Rebecca Teresa Reed, who was under the influence of Roman Catholics about two years 
and an inmate of the Ursuline Convent on Mount Benedict, Charleston, Massachusetts, nearly six months in the years 1831 to 1832. So that one was very uh, popular. Uh, sold 10,000 copies in Boston at the time, uh, ended up with the burning of a convent. We'll talk more about that here uh, in a minute. The more popular uh, book uh, was written by a woman named Maria Monk uh, with a Protestant minister uh, who uh, helps write uh, the, the book. Um, the book called the awful disclosures of maria monk or the uh, the full title the awful disclosures of the hotel du convent of montreal or the secrets of black nunnery revealed uh, it was reprinted six times in 1836 it was so popular uh, that it kept selling out uh, and it was reprint reprinted uh, as late as 1960 uh, during the uh, presidential run of john f kennedy um Certainly, it's still available uh, in various places, but, um, you know, as, as far as like actual current reprinting, uh, uh, you know, throughout the, the 19th century and even a couple times in the 20th century. So what were some of these awful disclosures that Maria Monk shared with uh, with her reading public? And we'll talk a little bit uh, about that. Well, some of the major ones were the that priests and nuns were actually not celibate and that there were a variety of illicit sexual relations that were taking place between priests and nuns in a nearby convent and monastery in Montreal. And in fact, uh, Monk claimed that there was a secret tunnel between the monastery and the convent that uh, priests would use to come into the convent so they wouldn't be seen. Um, and the nuns were basically ordered to kind of give themselves up to the priest's sexual desires. And, uh, you know, this was, was frequently going on. Now, as you might expect, there would certainly be some of these unions that would lead to um, pregnancy. So what was done then? Well, Monk also claimed that um, that these babies were born, they were baptized to um, you know save their souls, but then were killed. And she claims that she comes across uh, you know in the basement of the convent this huge uh, common pit where all of these babies have been uh, baby bodies have been. Um, you know, placed. The story is one of coercion, conspiracy, murder. There is one tale in there of uh, uh, a nun named Frances who refuses to submit to this. She doesn't want to be involved uh, in, you know, these kind of illicit relationships with the priest. And so she just refuses to, to do it. And some of the other nuns um, take her and um, throw her on a bed, put a mattress on top of her, sit on the mattress until she is basically smothered and killed. Well, these were the so-called awful disclosures. None of them were true. They were all lies. Um, there's no indication that she was ever a nun. Um, she, the only, ca the only contact, um, that it appears that she had with Catholics was in a convent, or excuse me, in an asylum, asylum, not a convent. Um, she had had a slate pencil rammed in her head at the age of seven. And so there's a question as to how uh, much of a uh, fullness of her faculty she had. Um, and so she was in an asylum for a while, a Catholic asylum. Um, and that seems to be the, the only indication um, of this. Um, she gets pregnant there and asked or, or asked to leave the convent when she's pregnant. 
um, becomes the mistress of one of the ministers that r- helps write the book, uh, who is very anti-Catholic. Um, she will leave him in 1837, a year after the book is published, um, and become a mistress with somebody else, and uh, eventually leaves that uh, as well and becomes a prostitute. She is arrested after trying to pickpocket one of her clients and is sent to prison where she will end up dying. So the true disclosures of Maria Monk um, are a little bit more um, problematic. And so it's important to understand that none of what Maria Monk says is true. Uh, You know, people, you know, went to the, the convent. It wasn't as she described, et cetera, et cetera. Anti-Catholicism, though, sometimes had some very uh, real effects uh, that were very violent. Um, For example, in uh, Boston, a group of nuns known as Ursulines, they're known as the Nuns of Adventure, um, they ran an elite boarding school, and a majority of the girls that attended this school were not Catholic. About 90% of them were Protestant. Well, in July of 1834, a nun who is suffering from delirium, right? She's just delirious. She's sick. She's not feeling well. She wanders away from the convent and ends up approaching a uh, farm family and asks to be taken to her brother in Boston. Um, and this is the Boston area, so the, the convent isn't specifically in Boston, uh, it's near Boston. So, well, she stays at their home overnight. The next morning, the mother superior arrives to bring her back to the convent, and the nun goes willingly, but people start to get suspicious. Right? And so this family starts talking about it, and there are a lot of rumors Right, that she's been kidnapped from her brother's house, uh, she's been chained in a basement, um, and so there's a variety of people start to, to do. What do we do about this wicked convent? And so they decide that what they need to do is uh, storm the convent and free the nuns. Now, around the same time, uh, a man named Lyman Beecher, a preacher named Lyman Beecher, who was the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who uh, writes uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. We talked about him a little bit when we talked about the Second Great Awakening. Um, He's been preaching a sermon called The Devil and the Pope of Rome in three different churches in the area, Um, you know, kind of making this connection between the devil and the pope. And so that's just kind of added to the hysteria uh, at the time. So this mob forms outside of the convent. Uh, There's about 60 men that will be involved in actions against the convent over the next seven hours with over 2,000 spectators there. These men storm the convent. They smash the place. um, They put on the nuns' habits. That's the clothes the nuns wear. Uh, they build a bonfire and they're performing all sorts of crazy rituals as well. I wouldn't be surprised if alcohol was involved. Uh, the convert, the convent is burned to the ground. Now the nuns, um, escape this. They, they kind of are chased into a garden, uh, where they're kind of trapped for a while. They're eventually rescued by, um, uh, a neighbor, um, and so the girls uh, as well, uh, the, the students, um, they're the nuns, the students, uh, are taken away from there. Nuns are taken into private homes. Uh, the girls are sent back to their families. After the mob is finished with burning down the convent, they start to attack Irish homes. Um, eventually the men are put on trial. The, the men that were involved in this. Uh, the attorney general wants to ask the potential jurors if they have Catholic pre- uh, prejudice uh, as they're doing jury selection, and the judge doesn't allow him to do so. Um, and the men are acquitted of all charges. 
a lot of uh, Catholic churches uh, in the Boston area, uh, Massachusetts, other places, um, post even get to the point of posting armed guards at their doors uh, to uh, you know try and protect congregants. Um, you know, in, in other places there are riots against Irish. Um, you know, gun battles, churches burnt down, uh, for example, in Philadelphia, uh, which, you know, causes more and more of a retreat away from American society. And in some places, these tight, cohesive worlds are created, some of them kind of very detached from uh, the rest of American culture because they are very concerned about uh, what will take place with, uh, you know, the Protestants and the way Protestants are, are treating them. And so as we look at the 19th century, there is great changes taking place in Catholicism with this rise of, um, you know, immigration. And with that immigration came a lot of fears, fears because they are immigrants, fears because they are the other, fears because they are Catholic. And so as there's this great transformation taking place in Catholicism, there are a lot of fears as well about what Catholics will do, could do, um, fears about what they're doing to American culture, fears about what they're doing to democracy. And, and that will persist uh, throughout the 19th century and to even some extent into the 20th century, though on a much smaller scale, uh, because a large portion of Catholics have been mainstreamed. In, in the 20th century. Uh, but still, even today, you will find uh, some Protestants who might not go to these extremes, um, but are still playing into the same kinds of fears about what Catholics could and would do if given the chance. Uh, while other uh, Protestants have become more welcoming uh, to uh, interactions with Catholics, a lot of that shaped by politics and shaped by trying to make political impact uh, in the United States, particularly on an issue like abortion. Right? Many conservative Protestants find common cause with Catholics who are also very pro-life, uh, share similar, uh, many share similar ideas about uh, government and, and similar types of things. Uh, and so there, there's a common cause between some Protestants and some Catholics over some of these things. But we'll talk more about um, those kind of changes and the changes that take place in the 20th century in a later session.